In this chapter, we're going to be looking at sort of the concept of what a product is. We're going to be breaking it down into the two groups of goods and services. And then we're going to be looking a little bit at some of the marketing techniques specifically built for services. And then toward the very end, we're going to be talking about a very important concept, and that is branding strategies. Let's get going. A product is anything that's offered to the market for attention, acquisition, use, or consumption that might satisfy a need or want. Broadly defined, a product includes services, events, persons, places, organizations, and ideas, or some mix of these. Thus, a product may be an idea, that physical entity, which we call a good, a service, or a combination. It exists for the purpose of exchange and the satisfaction of an individual and, and organizational objectives. Now, while the term products and services is occasionally used, product is a term that encompasses both the goods, the physical entities, and the services. Now, services are a form of a product that contains some sort of activities, benefits, or satisfaction offered for sale that are essentially intangible, meaning we can't feel them, we can't hold them, and they don't result in some sort of ownership of anything. But when we look at service, basically as a word, it sort of has a dual meaning. First, products such as bank loans and home security that are basically intangible are exchanged directly from the producer to the user. They can't be transported or stored. They're almost instantly perishable. So service products are often difficult to identify because they come into existence at the same time they are bought and consumed. They comprise this intangible element that's inseparable from the actual experience. They usually involve some sort of customer participation in some way. They can't be sold in the sense of ownership transfer and they basically have no title. Today, however, most products are partially tangible and partially intangible. The dominant form of the product is used to classify them either as a good or service. However, remember that all products include goods and services. Now, these common hybrid forms, whether they are called or whatever they may be called, they may or may not have the attributes of being totally an intangible service. Think of a business such as a travel service or entertainment event, like a movie or a concert or play. Even healthcare has sort of a combination of both service and product. Now the second meaning surrounding service are, act, are activities performed by the sellers and others that accompany the sale of the product and aid in its exchange or utilization. So we can think of shoe fitting in a store, financing a car, or an 800 number for getting more information. Now these are either performed pre or post sale and they supplement the product. They do not comprise it and they're not considered to be part of the product. However, if these services are performed during the sale, they are considered to be an intangible part of the product. Now a company's marketing offering quite often includes both tangible goods and services. At one extreme, the market offering may consist of pure tangible goods, and at the other extreme, pure services. Between these two extremes, however, many goods and service combinations are available. Today, companies are moving to this new level in creating value for their customers. To differentiate their offerings in the consumer's minds, companies have had to go beyond simply making products or delivering services. Firms are creating and managing customer experiences with their brands and or companies. Customers often think that the product is simply the physical item that he or she buys. But we're going to take a look at products and explore the nature of the product a little further. When we do, we want to look at what we call the three levels of products. The core product, the actual product, and the final augmented product. Now, the core product is not the tangible, physical aspect of the product. You can't touch it. This is because the core product is the benefit of the product that makes it valuable to the consumer. The core product deals with what is bought by the consumer. For example, if you buy an Apple iPad, you're buying more than just a tablet computer. You're buying entertainment, self-expression, productivity, 
and maybe even more importantly, connectivity with your family and friends. You're buying this connectivity, and this is the benefit of owning and using the product. Now, the actual product is the tangible physical aspect or good. A product planner must in turn the core benefits into actual product. They need to develop products or service features, design and quality level, and brand name and packaging. For example, the iPad is an actual product. Its names, parts, styling, operating features, and packagings and other attributes all have been carefully combined to deliver the core customer's value of staying connected. The augmented product is the non-physical part of the product. It usually consists of a lot of added value for which the consumer may or may not pay a premium. Product planners must build an augmented product around the core benefits and the actual products offered additionally to such as customer service and benefits. For example, when consumers buy an iPad, they're also getting basically Apple and the retailer warranty on the parts. They're offered repair services if it's needed. And Apple has a website to use if they're having a problem or some sort of a question. Apple may also provide access to a huge assortment of apps. And there's uncounted number of accessories that you can buy for your iPads. What you want to take away from this is that the features and benefits of a product are also relevant to all three levels of this product. A product tends to have many features, but only a small number of benefits to the actual consumer. A marketer should aim to discover the consumer's desired benefits and then match the individual features of that product or service to the desired benefits. Products fall into two broad classes based on the type of consumers who use them. Customer products are bought by the final consumer for personal consumption. These products differ in the way that consumers buy them and therefore how they're marketed. Now we're going to take a closer look at consumer products coming up a little later in this lecture. So let's look at industrial products. And those are products purchased for further processing or for use in conducting business. Industrial products are generally broken into three sort of major categories. The first one is material and parts. This is where the raw materials, manufactured materials, and manufactured parts come into play. So we think of raw materials, they can be things like farm products, corn used for making ethylene, or natural products such as silver that's used in making all kinds of components. Whereas manufactured materials such as plastic and parts like circuit boards are consistent of component parts and are often used within making the final product. Capital items are industrial products that aid in the buyer's production or operation. And this often includes the installation and accessory equipment. So installations are considered capital items, which consisted of major purchases such as buildings and fixed equipment. Anybody who's ever seen a car manufacturing line has seen those huge robots that help build cars. Supplies and services include operational supplies and the repairs and maintenance of items used within the firm. Now, the supplies, we kind of think of those as sort of convenient products of the industry field because they're purchased with minimum effort or comparison. At a university, we go through so much paper, we don't even really think too much about reordering it. It's pretty simple. Repair and maintenance that comes from the outside of the company, those would be considered an industrial service. However, if it's your own cleaning service that you hire from within your company, basically they're your employees, they are not considered an industrial service. So when you hire the company from outside to come in and clean, that would be considered basically an industrial service. So let's take a closer look at consumer products. We generally break them into four major groups. I'm going to use cakes as basically the product, the first P to help us demonstrate these four groups. So convenience is the first group. If I'm in the mood for cake, I may run down to my local vending machine and get a little hostess cupcake. 
I can go to 7-Eleven and buy that Hostess cupcake. Basically, I'm not going to think much about it. There's a little effort in my having to purchase it, and it's probably not going to bust my bank to buy a Hostess cupcake. However, now I'm thinking about my son's 18th birthday coming up. And so there, I'm going to want something a little bit better than the Hostess cupcake. I'm now going to go shopping for this product. I'm going to have more effort into it. It's probably going to be more risky for me to pick the wrong thing. Whereas in that convenient product, there really wasn't a lot of risk. If I really didn't like that cupcake, I could turn around and buy a Snickers. But I'm only going to get one shot at an 18th birthday birthday cake. And then there are highly specialized things that let's hope you only do once in your life. And that's the wedding cake. Okay, some of you maybe two or three times. But basically, this is a specialty. And because it's a specialty, the wedding cake, we're going to spend more time and we're probably going to have a stronger preference for what we wish. We're not going to basically give in too much unless there's a little bit of price stuff. But the wedding cake is going to have to be special to us. And so we're not going to go down to the local vending machine to buy it. And then finally, there's unsought products. And you may not know this, but there are actually cakes for funerals, funeral cakes. So if you didn't know that, it shows again why this is an unsought product. It's not something you go out and seek. There are a lot of products that do fall into this. Funeral plots is another example. But let's take a little closer look at this and look at some of the other P's. So we looked at product breaking them into the four groups. Let's look at place distribution. Convenience basically means it's widespread. It's available pretty much everywhere. And that little hostess cupcake, if you think about it, you can get that in a huge amount of different places. Not only can you run down to your local little vending machines and go to 7-Eleven, I've even bought the hosted cupcakes one time for my son when we were in an auto parts store. It's widely convenient. Whereas that birthday cake, now that's not gonna be available everywhere. But you may be saying in your head, but I could go into any Publix or any grocery store and get a birthday cake. Well, that's true, but you're talking about companies within an industry. We have to think at the industry level, basically the macro level when we talk about place or distribution. The truth is, is that yes, you can probably buy a birthday cake at almost any grocery store. That's where you should buy them. But you're not gonna go to the auto parts store or to the vending machine. So it's gonna be a selected few industries that are going to have this product. Whereas at birthday cake, we may even narrow down that to even fewer places. You might say, but I can go to Publix and get a birthday cake. I can also go to Publix and get a wedding cake. And it is true that some Publixes will make wedding cakes, but they've picking up a very special consumer group and their wedding cake business has really, well, it's not advertised too much anymore because they really found that people went to specialty stores or single bakeries or people who specialized in making wedding cakes. And then when it comes to an unsought product, well, the truth is, is that that varies. It would depend. In some cases, we might be able to go to a shopping or a specialty, but it would depend on the product itself. As far as promotion is concerned, you would think that the more convenient a product is, the more basically promotion there has to be. But the thing is, is that generally when it becomes a mass market item like this, it's probably going to be promoted by the producer. 7-Eleven isn't going to advertise them. That little vending machine sure isn't going to advertise those little hostess cakes. But you also have to look at the fact that those hostess cakes are going to be a lot less cost as far as the other cakes are concerned. And because it's less cost, it's much less risky for me. So generally our convenient products are going to be products that have less risk. Whereas we already said that my shopping product was going to have higher risk, thus it's probably going to have a higher price. And the advertising is quite often also accompanied by some personal selling. And we might say both the producer and retailers sort of promoting this product. Whereas with specialty products, we generally see this much more targeted promotion by both the producer and the reseller. 
So when we're advertising wedding cakes, we're probably not going to be putting them out into the general public. We're going to be looking exclusively for where brides are looking, or we're going to be with certain groups of people who help brides make things. We're also going to find that these are much higher in price specialty products. Often it's their limited value as far as where you can get them. So that higher price is there because we things, in this case, wedding cakes are more customizable, you might want to say. As far as those unsought products, the biggest difference with them is that really aggressive advertising has to be done. And quite often there's a lot of personal selling. Now it can be both by the producer and or the reseller. So let's go back to thinking about that cake for the funeral. I don't know too many people who are walking into a bakery saying, hey, I'd like to get a cake for the funeral. Quite often this might be something that is done by somebody who's helping plan the wake. Um, these days where we have professional people who develop um, the parties for weddings, we also have people who will go ahead and take care of everything for a wake. So they may go ahead and order all of those items for you. So they will come to you and say, hey, would you like to get this? I think it would be good. So each one of these different areas, convenience, shopping, specialty, and unsought, will have different ways that you approach them in both the product, the place, the promotion, and the price. So we talked about consumer and we talked about industrial, but the thing is, is that there are other types of marketing offerings. And today marketers have sort of broadened the concept to include these other ones. So let's take a quick look at some of these. One is organizational marketing. Now it consists of the activities undertaken to create, maintain, or change the attitudes and behaviors of a target consumer toward an organization. Now business firms sponsor sort of public relation events or advertising events, and they do corporate image marketing campaigns to market themselves and polish their image. Now I bring GE up here because GE is a producer of products that we call homogeneous products. Meaning is, is that they tend to look the same to consumers. We don't see huge differences. In this case, what I'm talking about is things like stoves, refrigerators, washers, dryers. If we really think about them, when they're lined up at Lowe's or Home Depot or wherever it is that you go look at them, they pretty much somewhat seem the same. And so what happens is, is that when you go to buy those products, you tend to look for the manufacturer. You look for the GE brand washing machine. You look for the Frigidaire brand refrigerator because you're buying the manufacturer because of their reputation. As such, it becomes important that the organization itself has marketed itself and you see the organization as being successful, reliable. Thus, it gives them more brand equity. The next one is person marketing. And this consists of activities undertaken to create, maintain, or change attitudes, and maybe even behaviors, toward a particular person. Now, if we use this skillfully, we can turn a person's name into a powerhouse brand. As an example, Rachel Way. She started in the Food Network, and depending on when you're listening to this, she's come and gone from the Food Network a couple of times. But basically, she's a one-woman marketing phenom. She has her own daytime talk show. She has cookware. She has dog food brand. She even has her own brand of extra virgin olive oil, Evo. I live in Florida. We can't talk about place marketing without looking at Florida. Basically, it involves the activities to create, maintain, or change attitudes toward a particular place. I mean, Florida lives and breathes based on tourism. And so they're going to spend as much time as they can to get consumers to understand, to see Florida in this way. Now, I love this picture of the beach. I have never seen the beach with only one person with a red umbrella on it. And I live about, oh, 15 steps from the beach. But we like to call us the Sunshine State. And yet anybody who lives here knows that in the spring, basically, you can set your clock by the 3 o'clock afternoon rainstorms. And finally, there's idea marketing. Now, for this particular lecture, we're going to just focus on social ideas. 
This idea in, in marketing is called social marketing, and it consists of the use of traditional business marketing concepts and tools to create behaviors that will hopefully incentivize individuals to do something for societal well-being. Social marketing involves much more than just advertising. It also involves a broad range of marketing strategies and marketing mix tools designed to bring about some sort of benefit and social change. So the stop plastic pollution in the oceans or basically in the rivers has been going on for a while and we're beginning to see some effect of that. That is basically an idea of marketing. Developing a product or service involves defining the benefits that will be offered. This is called the product's attributes. We define product attributes as the characteristics by which products will be identified and differentiated by customers versus other products. Now, product attributes usually comprise things like the features or the functions, the benefits and the uses of the good or service. The characteristics should be designed to satisfy stated and or implied customer needs. And when we do this, that is basically in the customer's mind, the product's quality. A product can be offered with many various features. Think about the number of different features that are in cars, from backup cameras to Wi-Fi to being able to call for help if you need. Another way to add customer value is through distinctive style and design. So when I bought my desk chair, I was looking for a particular style to match my office. I was also looking for one that had lumbar support. So that added value when I found the one I wanted. Now a brand is the name, term, sign, symbol, or design, or some combination of these that identify the maker or the seller of the product or service. Consumers view the brand as an important part of the product and branding can add value to a customer's purchase. Brand names help consumers identify products that might benefit them. Brands also say something about the product quality, at least in the mind of the consumer. And we'll be looking deeper at branding a little later in this lecture. Packaging involves designing the container or wrapper for the product. The package may vary from plastic bands to, I don't know, steel, wood box, maybe even a drum. However, packaging also comes in different forms or basically different levels. The primary package contains the actual product. A secondary contains more than one primary package and the tertiary contains more of than one secondary package. So if we think about this, if I go to buy a box of Band-Aids, the box that the Band-Aids actually come in, that's the primary container. However, that may be shipped to the store in a box that has 12 boxes of these Band-Aids in it. And that box may be in another box that has not just Band-Aids, but also has, I don't know, tape for um, gauzes. And it may have gauze. It may have four or five different things in there. And that would be the tertiary. In some cases in larger stores, we may find that they carry multiples of this product. And so they have box after box after box inside a bigger box. And those are the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary packaging. Now with increased competition, it's really pushed packaging to now perform many things, including the sales tasks. Packages now are built to attract customers and commute branding positions and maybe even to close the sale. If you think about it, sometimes when you buy something, you're really buying the sort of the prettiness of the package if you're thinking about giving a gift. When you buy at Christmas time some of those cheeses and sausages, when they're mailed to the house as a gift, you want the package to be pretty. You want it to look nice. And Hickory Farms has a very decorative outside package, which would be the secondary package, because inside of it would be the primary package that the consumer would get. But the question is, is where was this shipped from? If it was shipped from the local store, then there would be a tertiary package, which would have several of these secondary packages in that would be prepped for mailing. And of course, the secondary packages would then be packed with primary packages. 
it's actually not so complex, but it is a huge area within marketing. And one, if you have a little talent toward art or writing, can be very profitable as far as a living is concerned. Now, the other thing we have to talk about if we're talking about packaging is labels or labeling, which is mostly what we call it. Now, this is the information attached to or printed directly on the product for the purpose of naming it and describing its use. Maybe it's dangers. Ladders have got lots of labeling about that. It's ingredients. So you think about the, the list on the back of something that you eat, the manufacturer and many things. Many of this is required by law. Some of these things are not, but they're put there because they're a way to inform the customer what's going on. So a label is usually thought of as this printed material, but labeling in a broader sense has been ruled to include spoken information and separate promotional pieces as long as this information's purpose is closely allied to the product. Labels basically are there to help identify and describe the product or brand as well as promote the brand, you know, support the positioning and engage the customers. Now, the first step in designing product support services is to survey the customers periodically. Now, once a customer has assessed the quality of the various support services, it can adapt steps to fix which ones are not working well, or maybe add new services that will both delight the customer and yield more profits for the company. When we talk about existing companies, there's a couple of terminologies that we'd like you to know, or at least would be good for you to know. And that's talking about the product mix. Now, the product mix of a company is often defined in sort of three different measures. The first one we tend to talk about is the width. Now, the width is basically saying is, is how many different lines of product do they have? A line is basically kind of going down like this. So in this case, I'm talking about Disney. And when we look at the width, we can see that it is five wide. Now, the other terminology that quite often is used is something called depth. So over here, we can see that the consumer depth, consumer product depth is five deep. We got movie merchandise, Disney publishing, Disney toys, apparel, and video games. So for consumer products, we'd say it's five deep. But recently, Disney has added Disney Plus. So now they would have to consider where is Disney Plus going to sit? Is it going to add to a line? Maybe it comes underneath a media cable? Or is it media broadcasting? Well, it may decide that it's not either one of those, that really it's a new product line. If they think it's a new product line, then basically they're going to fit it in here. And they would have Disney Plus as a streaming service. Well, no longer are we five wide anymore because we've added a new line. So now we are basically six wide. So the terminology we want to pull out of here is to understand when we talk about the width, which is how many different lines we have, how deep a line is, and the overall mix is everything that they have combined that they sell or offer within a company. Now we've looked at goods, but now let's take a quick look at sort of the four special service characteristics a company must consider when they're designing their marketing program. The intangibility means that you can't feel or touch something. So as I discussed before, many services are completely intangible. Others are just strongly intangible. No matter what, this leaves a customer concerned due to not being able to view the product that they would be buying or consuming. Yeah, so to reduce uncertainty, what buyers are going to do is look for what they call qualities of service or signs of service or signs of quality, all the same thing. Basically, they're going to draw the conclusion about the quality of the service from the location, the people, equipment, communications, advertising that they've seen. So as an example, this lecture that I offer as a teacher, it's basically a service. My lecture is not tangible. And so if you're a student going into a lecture hall, you don't know what you're going to get. Now, one way I've made these lectures more tangible is by having these videos. But if you didn't have these videos and you had a choice of instructors, you'd want to maybe seek out a video. You might want to seek out your friends. You're basically going to look for the different things that could let you know whether or not 
the service, the lecture that this person is going to give is of a quality that you're looking for. Because customers and services are linked together, you kind of think of customers as being almost co-producers. Now this makes what we call the provider customer interaction sort of a special feature of service marketing. Both the provider and the customer affect the service outcome. So using personal trainers perhaps as a good example of this. The trainer and the customer must work together in order to provide the service. And they're interlinked. So that linkage, that sort of connection that the two of them have affects the ability of the service to be offered. Variability is because no person is the same. Everybody's a little bit different. Thus the quality of service offer will also differ from person to person. Moreover, customers will have different perspectives of even the same service. So as an example, let's come back to these lectures. If I'm lecturing and there's a lot of students in the class, what we're going to find is that they're going to have different opinions about the interaction afterwards. They take a student survey. Some may give me very high results. Some may give me mid results. A couple others may give me poor results. And yet they all received exactly the same service. So we have to take that in consideration that different people may see things differently. But the other thing is, is that, you know, the truth is, is that you're not the same every day. So if an instructor comes in and this particular day, they're just not feeling really good. Maybe lunch didn't sit with them well. Maybe that night when they give lecture, they're not the same quality that they are normally each night. Even within something like Disney World, you have one person giving directions and another person giving directions and the service that they each are giving could be slightly different and also at a different level. Now, finally, one of the things that's very interesting about services is that they're basically perishable. You can't store them. You can't save them. They're consumed, as we said, at the same time that they're given. So for me, I always think about a theatrical play when I think about perishability. I go in, the service I'm given is the play, it's entertainment. It's not tangible. At the end of the play, I leave. I don't have anything that I can take away with me from the actual service. Now, I can take a playbill with me, perhaps. I go out and buy a button or some sort of magnet, but that isn't really the main product. Remember, the main product was the play. So these are all things that we have to consider when we think about services. Service marketing requires marketers to think beyond the traditional four P's of marketing. You know, it helps to look at service marketing more as a triangle. So the service marketing triangle shows the key activities that happen between the key actors in the marketplace. Each actor works together to develop, promote, and deliver the company's service. So the company, of course, at the top refers to the leadership team of the company. The employees to one side refer to all employees including the subcontractors who may deliver the company services. And customers refer to not only the current customers, but potential companies' clients. Now the lines between the actors show different types of marketing that must occur. External marketing occurs between the company and the customers. Companies use external marketing to make promises to customers. Think of the external marketing as any communication between the customers or potential customers that happens before the service delivery is even started. There are many forms of external marketing, including advertising and personal selling. You might see public relations, some direct mail, just to name a few. Now, the aim is to create awareness. You know, we want to set price expectations setting sort of what the service level to be expected is, and basically informing customers of any prerequisites that must be in place before they can use the service. Internal marketing occurs between the company and its employees. Now, service businesses should view employees as internal customers. That's because they are the market in which the company must please first. The leadership team should focus on satisfying employees so that they want to have better service to their customers. This means that the service firms must orient and motivate its customer contact employees and support service employees to work as a team to provide the best customer satisfaction possible. Interactive marketing occurs between the employees and the customers. 
It is here where the promises made during external marketing are either kept or broken by the employees or subcontractors. Service quality depends heavily on the quality of the buyer-seller interaction during these service encounters. In service marketing, service quality depends on both the service delivered and the quality of that delivery. Each significant interaction between the employees and the customer is known as a service encounter. So with interacting, interactive marketing, it's important because it establishes both the short-term and the long-term satisfaction of your customers. That is, if the customer is satisfied with the service they receive in the short term, they're more likely to be satisfied over a longer term. So how does this all work? Well, let's take a look at a hair salon. First, they'll have some external marketing. The salon wants to inform customers through advertising that the salon can now do these complex multicoloring dye jobs. Think of it as rainbow hair. They communicate to customers that their staff understands the complex processes and are willing to answer any questions before they start the job. The salon chooses basically to tweet about this new service in the picture. Now, to ensure the salon can deliver on the promise they have focused, they now need to look at their internal marketing. They will need to ensure that the staff has had proper training and the tools to complete the job. The staff needs to feel that they have the time needed to help and do this job properly. The salon also makes a checklist of correct dye colors to make the correct rainbow effect. Now, a customer has come in and the customer has gone through the process of having this done. The salon can handle the interactive marketing in several ways. But let's say they've hired a social media manager. This person responds to a tweet that the customer has posted about the service. They notice the customer has done this tweet in the picture of the outcome, and they would respond perhaps positively by making some nice comment about the hair, and that would make the customer feel very special. This service model is based on the fact that all service businesses are about promises. Businesses make promises to its customers through external marketing. The business facilitates its employees to keep those promises through internal marketing. And finally, the business delivers on that promise through interactive marketing. We're about to take a deeper dive into branding. But I saw this quote by Michael Eisner. He's the former CEO of Disney. And I thought this quote really sort of undermines a lot of what we try to say, especially about service marketing, that it's this product of a thousand small gestures. And with that philosophy, Disney has always been very successful in learning how to brand and keep a brand in a position within the consumer's mind that is extremely successful. Let's sort of examine a little bit about branding strategies. We have to understand that there are different level of brands and there could even be something called a generic brand, which basically refers to a type of consumer product on the market that lacks a wide recognition of name or logo because uh, typically it isn't advertised. Generic brands are usually less expensive than their name brand counterpart due to their lack of promotion, which can inflate costs and goods and services. Now we put brand at the top but understand that brands can be divided into two major groups. Manufacturer brands are basically the producer and the producer is responsible for marketing the brand and the brand is owned by that producer. Now the advantage of manufacturer brands are that it develops customer loyalty to the name, it attracts new customers and enhances prestige. It can ensure sort of like dealer loyalty also. Kellogg is a great example of basically a manufacturer, so is Procter & Gamble. Now, private brands are basically owned by either a retailer or a wholesaler. They're also sometimes known as a store brand. Sam's is an example of a private brand who's owned by Walmart. Pretty much every pharmacy has their own private brand, and quite often it's just simply the name of the company, so it's the Walgreens brand. Now, these brands can offer customers excellent value for the money. They add bargaining power also, let's say, when a retailer, when it comes to negotiating prices and terms with manufacturers. After all, the retailer doesn't produce the product itself. 
Now, another advantage of a private brand is that they're highly profitable for the reseller. And there's less pressure to mark down the prices, and it also can tie the customers directly to the retailer. But now we need to go down to the next level. And in the next level, you'll see individual brand, a family brand, and basically a combination of brands. Now an individual brand is using a different brand name for different products. So while Kellogg's is the producer, it also makes Pringles. You may not know that, but that's an individual brand. The family brand marketing uses several different products under the same brand name. So underneath Mr. Clean, Mr. Clean has many different basically brands. There's cleaning liquids, but they also make cleaning gloves, brushes, and brooms. A combination is used when an individual family and manufacturer or private brand are connected. So we'll go back to Kellogg's and it's Kellogg's Raisin Bran. Now we often need to do the combination of these so we can help the consumer distinguish the different types of brands because there are lots of Raisin Brands out there. And so by adding the manufacturer's name, we have been able to uh, help the consumer understand which Raisin Bran that they're talking about. So brands are a key element in a company's relationship with its customers. A brand can represent a customer's perception and feelings about a product. And a powerful brand has high brand equity. Now brand equity is the differential effect that knowing the brand name has on a customer's response and their actions to a company's products and marketing versus let's say a generic or competition's brand. Now when we look at brand equity, there's sort of three components to it. The first one is basically consumer's perceptions. This includes both the knowledge and the experience a customer has with the brand and the brand's product. This in turn builds brand equity. The perception that a target market holds about a brand directly results in either what we say a positive or negative effect. A brand that has a positive effect or positive brand equity is when consumers react more favorably to it than to the generic or the competitor's brand. A second thing to think about is that if a customer is willing to pay the higher price for the brand's product, even though they could get that same thing for the competitor for less, the customer in effect is paying a price premium to do business with the firm that they know and they admire. This directly leads to the third component, which is that companies with higher brand equity often enjoy basically spending less than the competitors to produce the product and bring it to market. The difference in price goes to the bottom line. The firm's brand equity enables it to make a bigger profit on each sale because of the premium. On the other hand, if the brand has a negative brand equity and consumers basically see it as less favorable than either the competition or an unnamed brand, this could result in a lack of sales and that could drive up costs and maybe even eventually see businesses go out of business. So a brand with high brand equity is a very valuable asset to a company. Brand value though, is the total financial value of a brand. Brand value is determined by how much someone is willing to pay for that brand. For example, when a survey was recently done about brand value, it was found that people surveyed placed different monetary values on the same car. The people in the survey were given a photo of a car. They were all the same car, but basically it was Photoshopped to have different logos superimposed. This suggested that they were different brands of these cars. The results showed that Volkswagen brand is seen to have a higher value than Ford, while Mercedes brand has basically the highest value over both of them. So not too long ago, the Business Insider in 2019 looked at some of the top global brands and their values. If Apple was to just sell the name Apple, it would basically be worth $243 million. The Disney brand, which is in the last one in the top 10, would be worth $44.3 million. Now, those of you who are in accounting, will understand that this has to go basically into the value of the company because the name has value. 
basically looking at this matrix, we're looking at brand names that either exist or they'd be brand new or product categories of existing or new categories. So that gives us basically four choices that a company has when it comes to developing its brand. If the product category and brand already exist in the company, then line extension, basically making the depth of the line, is most often what seems to be the most reasonable to do. I mean, this occurs basically when the company extends some sort of existing brand into new forms or colors or ingredients, flavors of existing product category. A company might want to introduce a line extension at a low cost, low risk way to introduce a new product, or it might want to just meet some sort of consumer's desire for variety, or maybe they have excess capacity. Basically, the, the other thing they like to do is what we say, command more shelf space from the reseller. So if we think about something that's out there that's pretty common, we'll talk about Pop-Tarts. Now, Pop-Tarts are a very well-known brand by Kellogg's, and they're demanded by consumers. So if Pop-Tarts decides that guava now is the up-and-coming fruit because they've seen that other people are starting to make guava products, and they make a Pop-Tart with guava, they're going to go to their reseller, let's say Publix, and say, I want to put guava on the shelf. Now Publix has got to make a decision because in order to put that Pop-Tart box on the shelf, something has to come off the shelf. So are they going to take another Pop-Tart off or are they going to take perhaps another brand's version of something off the shelf? And if that other brand, let's call it XYZ, has two areas of shelving, they may decide that XYZ is not selling that well so Kellogg's can sort of push themselves into that space, leaving XYZ with only one line on the shelf instead of having two spaces on the shelf. It's a very common thing to do and why you quite often see a large variety of a current brand with multiple different offerings. Now brand extension extends when an existing brand name to a new or modified product in the category. It gives a new product basically instant recognition and faster acceptance, but an extension may also confuse the image or the brand name. So let's say Mr. Clean adds a floor cleaner product to its brand. It would make sense because we already think about cleaning things. And if somebody goes to buy products and they're already liking Mr. Clean and they have hardwood floors, which has been a trend over the last few years, they may easily decide just to simply go buy this. Now, multiple branding offers a way to establish different features that appeal to different customer segments. You can lock up also more retail shelf space and capture a larger market share. The biggest drawback of multiple branding is that each brand might obtain only a small market share and none may be very profitable. Now, again, my favorite product to look for this is Soap and Procter & Gamble. They are definitely multi-branding, and in a way, they compete amongst themselves in order to make sales. So if Procter & Gamble brings out another soap, would the retailer even have another brand to remove that isn't already a Procter & Gamble brand? Lastly, a company may believe that the power of its existing brand name Basically, it's waning, and so a new brand is needed, or it may create a new brand name when it either it enters a new product category for which its current brand names are not appropriate. For example, when Kellogg's brought in Pringles into the company, it didn't seem to make sense for it to call it Kellogg's or any of the things before, so it disassociated the manufacturer name with the name Pringles because it was a new brand. To wrap this lecture up, let's remember that companies must manage their brands carefully. Companies must continuously communicate the brand's positioning to its consumers. Major brand marketers often spend huge amounts of money in advertising to create brand awareness and build preferences and loyalty. The brand's positioning will not take hold unless everyone in the company lives the brand. Therefore, a company needs to train its people to be basically customer-centered. Moreover, today's customers 
have come to know a brand through a wide range of contacts and touch points. These include advertising, but also personal experiences with the brand, word of mouth, social media, company web pages, mobile apps. Oh, there's so many more. Companies need to periodically audit their brands for their strengths and weaknesses with their customers. A brand audit may turn up brands that need more support, brands that need to be dropped, or brands that need to be rebranded or repositioned because of changing customer preferences and new competitors. Branding is something that isn't done once. It must be continuously monitored and reviewed.